The focus of our meeting today is on the financial demands facing state governments. These include billions of dollars in unfunded pension liabilities, rising health care costs, and deteriorating public education. How do state governments meet these formidable financial obligations, balance their budgets, and continue to serve the welfare of its citizens? Is it possible? Is there a solution? Will it take a miracle to stabilize the financial crises facing state governments across the country? If a miracle can be found, it is likely to come from Richard Ravage. <laughs> yes, who has rescued New York State time and again, accomplishing nothing short of miracles. That includes rescue from the bankruptcy of the New York State Development Corporation in 75, the city of New York in 75 and 76, the MTA in 79, he overhauled city government in 1988, making it more representative as chair of the Charter Revision Committee. He became lieutenant governor in 2009 and addressed another looming budget shortfall. It has taken courage and dedication to become involved in these turbulent events. He has come to be known as New York's Mr. Fix-It, or the go-to man, or the miracle man. Mayor Koch called him Renaissance Man. He might well have retired with these accolades and rested on his laurels. Instead, he is back in the business of public service. Among other things, he is co-chair with Paul Volcker of a task force that is examining state budgets with focus on borrowing, soaring health care costs, and pension liabilities, the very issues we have raised today. By any measure, by any name, Richard Ravage is a blessing to this state. And we feel especially blessed to have him here today to give us his thinking on how to fix state budgets in this time of crisis. What we really need are more R Richard Ravages in this state. <laughs> Um, I didn't accomplish a damn thing when I was lieutenant governor. That's the truth. Uh, and and I di except for the fact that I had a marvelous education and learning curve and came to understand perhaps what I should have understood before about state budget or New York State's budget. Uh, and <clears throat> that was that it was, to put it most felicitously, opaque to put it more dramatically, um, somewhat uh, intentionally incomprehensible. <laughs> and, and I learned that New York was not unique. Uh, and I got fascinated with the whole question of the sustainability of the course that states and their cities were on. And, uh, uh, with Paul Volcker and a group of others, including Peter Goldmark and Nick Brady and George Schultz and Alice Rivlin, and we've put together a, a, a very talented group of academics primarily and are doing a study which will be public in, in July. And I, I will try to share the, the basics with you. It's hard to avoid in describing these circumstances, uh, candidly, it's hard to avoid some legal and financial uh, language. And if it's not clear, I, I hope you will feel free to um, seriously to interrupt me. Um, every state has a statutory or constitutional requirement to have a balanced budget. But nobody has a law that defines the word revenue. So that states have been using the proceeds of the sale of assets or the proceeds of borrowing to generate cash, which they treat as a revenue for budget balancing purposes. Now let me give you a few illustrations of what New York State has done over the years. Um, when it
came to budget time. And they didn't want to cut government spending, and they didn't want to raise taxes. So one year, they sold Attica Prison to the New York State Urban Development Corporation, a, a state entity, which paid for it by issuing $250 million of bonds to the public, which was serviced by the rent the state paid when it rented back uh, Attica Prison. And that $250 million, the purchase price for Attica Prison, was treated as a revenue for budget balancing purposes. Let me give you another illustration. Um, when the tobacco companies were sued uh, on the grounds you know, that they were causing cancer, and there was a massive macro settlement with all the states, because everybody, every state was a plaintiff in that litigation. And as part of the settlement, there was a stream of revenue that went to every state. New York State uh, took that stream of revenue and hypothecated it, borrowed against it, treated the proceeds of that borrowing as a revenue. Um, and instead of having that stream of payments by the tobacco companies uh, uh, constitute a, a continued source of revenue, of real recurring revenue, to uh, it, expand health care, which is what the intention of the litigation was. That's why uh, there was a lawsuit. That's why the tobacco companies settled. The whole purpose was provide better health care as a result of the cancer-causing uh, use of tobacco. I could give you, sit here and give you an hour's worth of other illustrations, but this has happened all over the country. And the problem with it, of course, is that you don't have an unlimited amount of assets to sell, and you don't have the ability to borrow an infinite amount of money, and therefore, at some point in time, this methodology of balancing your budget is unsustainable. Now, let me put it in the context of 2008. Um, uh, when the economic world fell apart in 2008, a lot of people said we're we're in a recession. We've had serious recessions before, and we'll be out of it in a couple of years. And therefore, um, well, let's get some temporary help from Washington uh, to prevent a dramatic reduction in state and local spending, on, particularly on education and on Medicaid. So we had what we know as the stimulus bill, uh, which uh, preserved uh, the level of state and local spending. Uh, but actually, because there was language in that bill that required that the state not reduce the scope of any services, it's called maintenance of effort language, the consequences of that were to build a platform higher off of which states are falling when the stimulus bill came to an end. Third of all, and this is what we're researching, in, in, it is not uniformly true. I, every state has its own constitutional and statutory framework, so therefore there's no universal truth. Everybody deals with these things somewhat differently, and I'll illustrate that in a few minutes. But what happened is that <coughs> This problem has been going on for a long time. And the practices that I described to you, that I illustrated, have been going on for a long time. And nobody saw any reason to sound alarm bells. In the interim, several other things happened. Healthcare costs 
generally, have gone up in most years two or three times the customary rate of inflation. Consequently, Medicaid expenses have gone up also a lot faster than the general cost of living because of the inflation in healthcare costs, but for another reason as well. During prosperous times, many states, New York particularly, expanded the eligibility. It was something that was hard to be against if, if your motive was to try to provide for health care for, for poor people. Um, and New York expanded its health care program, both in terms of who's eligible, but also the nature of the services that you are eligible for. I think certainly the last year that I was in Albany, the state of New York spent $54 billion on Medicaid. That's over a third of its all funds expenditure. Um, something else happened during this period of time, and that is people are living longer. And Therefore, the obligations that government subsume contractually to pay health care benefits or to pay pension benefits, uh, the cost of those increased for several reasons. Again, because the people lived longer, the costs went up, uh, and the returns in these pension funds have not been what they were in the more halcyon days of the uh, 70s and early 80s. So you have a, many of these pension funds uh, that are significantly underfunded and are not, in the long run, going to be able to make the benefit payments that they're obligated to make. I'll give you a few illustrations. New York, in that regard, by the way, is one of the better states uh, New Jersey and Illinois have no requirement whatsoever that the state contribute to the pension fund the amount of money which actuarially they should contribute every year to maintain an adequately funded pension system. Um, so when they have a tough budget year, they just don't contribute. As a result, in Illinois and New Jersey, for example, I think those pension funds are less than 50% funded. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the head of the teacher's retirement system in Illinois, in a public statement, made it very clear that, that uh, uh, they didn't have the ability to, to pay all the benefits that they were obligated to pay over the the longer term. Um, even Chris Christie, who is, I'm told, very conservative about budgets, just skipped a $3 billion contribution to the Jersey pension system that he was supposed to make in the first year, but was not statutorily obligated to make. Um, and I'm not being partisan about it, because John Corzine also skip payments he should have made when he was governor. Um, 